all persons having business before the Honorable Chief Judge and Associate Judges, now presiding of the District of Columbia Court of Appeals. Draw near and give your attention. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. This Honorable Court is now in session. Please come to order. Hey, uh, good morning. Um, we have uh, one case specially set this morning. Um, in the matter of Don Trace Blaine versus United States. Uh, we thank the parties uh, for your appearance on this Zoom virtual platform, which is how we are doing our oral arguments in light of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the arguments are also being live streamed uh, for any members of the public that wish to participate and watch. Are the parties uh, ready to proceed at this time, Council? Yes, Your Honor. All right, uh, Ms. Soltis. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. Deborah Soltis on behalf of appellant Don Trace Blaine. Mr. Blaine was convicted of second degree murder in a case arising from the fatal shooting of an innocent bystander in what the government characterizes as an urban gun battle case. The government's theory at trial was that Mr. Blaine, his associate, Mr. Burke, and their opponent, Mr. Carter, and possibly additional shooters, which the government conceded was corroborated by the evidence, participated in an urban gun battle in which Mr. Blaine's opponent, Mr. Carter, shot the fatal bullet that killed the innocent bystander, Mr. Adana Kinju. Now this was the government's third trial. At the first trial, Mr. Carter, who shot the fatal, bu fatal bullet, was acquitted. At the second trial, Mr. Burke was acquitted. At this trial, the government's sole focus was, of course, on Mr. Blaine, and their sole theory of liability was that Mr. Blaine's participation in the gun battle was enough to find him guilty of second degree murder. And they told the jury that repeatedly. The government argued that the only question the jury had to answer was, quote, who was there shooting? The government specifically argued that the timing of any shots by Mr. Blaine were irrelevant. Quote, it doesn't matter at what point Mr. Blaine was pulling his trigger, only that he was pulling his trigger. In fact, the government conceded that the exact sequence of events that led to the fatal shot that killed the decedent were unclear and explicitly argued to the jury in closing that it was an actual poss possibility in other words, an alternative theory that was corroborated by the government's own firearm and video evidence that Mr. Blaine may have in fact been gone from the scene of the urban gun battle at the time Mr. Carter fatal, fired his fatal shot and that others may have arrived and started shooting after Mr. Blaine was gone. At the trial, the trial court- Ms. 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 Soltis, can I uh, ask uh, about that? That because the facts or the sequence of events are a little murky. Um, if Mr. Blaine started the shooting and the sequence of events um, that, that uh, under the government's theory then prompted a responsive shooting or others began chiming in on the shooting, um, isn't that sufficient or is that sufficient under but for's causation? Whether he stayed throughout the um, entire battle or whether he left. If he set the events in motion by starting to shoot, is that um, sufficient to establish but for causation? And if not, why? It, it, well, two things, Your Honor. First of all, it's, it's not sufficient under Fleming. And secondly, it is not at all what the facts at, tr facts at trial would support. So first, under Fleming, we know that the defendant's actions, if subtracted, must have, would not have, another, if the defendant's actions were subtracted, the decedent would not have died. That's the standard under Fleming. On these facts, starting with number one, the government's key concession that others may have appeared on the scene and started shooting after Mr. Blaine left, cannot allow a finding of his conduct being the actual cause. In other words, based on the government's altern alternative theory, when Mr. Blaine left, the decedent was alive. So therefore, if we subtract out his conduct, 
of course the decedent doesn't is, isn't killed. If there is some murkiness in the facts and the sequence, um, because I'm, I'm not so sure, and I may not be clear on this part of the record, that the government concedes that Mr. Blaine left after he was shooting. I know Mr. Blaine contends that he left after the shooting, um, but if there is evidence in the record that would support uh, a, a jury concluding that he didn't leave and he stayed throughout the gunfight, um, how does that change, if at all, your analysis under Fleming but for causation? Because there's no evidence um, that would be sufficient that would have established that Mr. Blaine himself, that his own conduct initiated the gun battle, shot first. The evidence is insufficient. In fact- Put aside whether he shot first. Let me um, ask you, is, did the evidence establish that Mr. Blaine fired his weapon at all before Carter fired the shot that killed the decedent? Your Honor, the testimony from the eyewitnesses does not distinguish between any shots fired between Mr. Blaine and Mr. Burke or others. What the, what the testimony does show is that two witnesses testified that they heard shots coming from the playground side, which is the side that Mr. Blaine and Mr. Burke were placed on, you know, based on the witness testimony. Is it your position that the jury could have had a reasonable doubt about whether Blaine fired his weapon at all before Carter fired the fatal shot? I think it's inde indeterminate, Your Honor. I don't believe that the sequence of shots is determined. Well, I'm not talking about the sequence in terms of which of two people or more people fired in what order. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about whether Blaine whether the evidence, or whether one can say the jury found that um, Mr. Blaine did fire at Mr. Carter before Mr. Carter fired the fatal shot. I, I think that the, that the eyewitness testimony of Mr. Ramsher says that when he was looking out the window, he saw Blaine and Burke firing at Carter and Carter firing back. It is not clear at so what So there point. was some evidence that might support that reconstruction that Blaine fired before Carter fired the fatal shot. But you're, are you saying that nonetheless, the jury is a reasonable possibility the jury could have said, well, we doubt that. We're not, we're not prepared to find that beyond a reasonable doubt. I, the jury was relieved of its duty specifically. That's to not me. what I'm asking you. I'm trying to find what, let me, let me rephrase the question a little bit differently. What, what, in your view, would the jury had to have found um, in order to harbor a reasonable doubt uh, that Blaine was a but-for cause? Your Honor, I think Fleming gives us the exact scenario that the jury could have harbored on facts really very analogous to our facts here. So if we look at Fleming, we see Fleming is on one side of a gun battle along with his associate, um, Mr. Uh, excuse me, I was finding the back. Um, okay, that Fleming is on the same side as the, of the gun battle as Mr. Peoples and Mr. Peoples fires first at the, at the other side, that the other side Mr. Hamlin on the other side fires back, that Mr. Fleming starts firing from the balcony so that Fleming is firing, although there's no evidence that he fired first, but that he is firing before the fatal shot is fired, that Hamlin then shoots Jones, which is the third theory that goes up on appeal in Fleming, right? It's this theory that the opponent shot the fatal shot, just like in our case, is the government's actual sole theory. Yes, I and understand. In, right. And in Fleming, th this court said on bunk that it was entirely possible that the jury could have found that Fleming shooting prior to the fatal shot was a substantial factor, but that on those facts, they could not have concluded that he was that it was the actual cause of the fatal shot. 
In other words, well, I don't very... think they actually said. I mean, there is a very um, suggestive and interesting hypothetical that the Fleming opinion gives that we'll be wanting to ask about, I'm sure, during the course of this argument, that you've touched on it now. I'm not sure it absolutely said the jury could not find if Fleming had, if, if Fleming had uh, joined in before the fatal shot was fired. Um, but, but right now, we're just trying to find what you think the jury would have had to find um, on this evidence in order to in order to have a doubt, because we're asking ourselves um, if the jury had been properly instructed on um, but for causation, is there a reasonable probability that the outcome of this case would have been different? So, how what would the, what, what in your view would the Jewish thinking or could could the Jewish thinking reasonably have been to reach a different outcome? Different way. If, if you're asking. If the what the jury should have been asked to conclude should have suppose been the jury had been told to convict Mr. Blaine, mm -hmm. you have to find him as a but for cause of the um, victim's death, um, as we as we in, in accordance with Fleming. Okay, now um, what what is a reasonable um, uh, verdict that the jury could have reached acquitting Mr. Blaine? On what theory? What would they have been thinking? I think I think the problem is, Your Honor, that on these facts, I don't think they could conclude it. Well, so you're a juror and you're arguing with your fellow jurors that we ought to acquit. What would you say? That we cannot determine beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Blaine's conduct was the actual cause here of the fatal shot. And the reason is we can't determine that if Mr. Blaine never fired his gun, that Mr. Carter wouldn't have still ended up shooting and killing Mr. Adam Kinju. Well, suppose the, suppose a juror responds and says, look, there's a witness who tells us that from which we could find that Blaine was firing his gun. I believe that witness. So I think Blaine was firing. Then I'd, th yes, then the juror would say that there's been no evidence that Mr. Carter wouldn't have still shot and fired his gun if Mr. Blaine had never fired his, because there's evidence here that is just indeterminate about whether or not Mr. Carter would okay, have so fired so, so, so now let me ask you, this is a question that Blaine, that, that Fleming in a sense left open. Suppose two individuals are firing independently. Independently is the wrong word, they could be working together, but two individuals are firing. They're, they're what we sometimes call co-principles. And they're each firing at Carter. Now, if you subtract one of those individuals, you could say, well, um, the, the same thing would have happened. One of them was firing at Carter. He would have fired back and shot, the, uh, and shot and killed the victim. If you think that way, then, nobody, then murders can get committed and nobody's a but-for cause. Because you can always subtract either, 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 either principle. And, and reach the same result and say, well, can't, can't say beyond a reasonable doubt. Is that where your argument ends up? No, Your Honor. I, I think, first of all, I think there's always an actual, at least one actual- Well, in this particular case, why is that? In this particular case, Blaine and Burke are both shooting at Carter. You say, well, if we subtract Blaine, then, um, the same thing could have happened. And so you can't say beyond a reasonable doubt that Blaine was the but-for cause. Okay, now Socrates comes and says, well, but if you subtract Burke and Blaine was just the shooter, you can't say um, the same thing wouldn't have happened. So Burke wasn't the but-for cause. So you've, you've created a situation by this analysis, if you follow that lot line of reasoning in which um, a victim gets killed by Mr. Carter's bullet <laughs> and nobody except, I guess you could say Mr. Carter, is the but for cause. No, 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 and by Mr. Carter is acquitted because he's acting in self-defense and it was an accident and so forth. So that's a little troubling result, isn't it? Well, Your Honor, I mean, I, you know, no one being culpable for murders is, is certainly can be troubling. But 
in this case, if the government has- It suggests there's something wrong with the theory, at least as applied in those circumstances. That, but that's that's not that that's not the theory, Your Honor. The theory is that the government can't prove that if you subtract, and this isn't my, these aren't my words. This is the en banc court's words that if, if you subtract out Mr. Blaine's conduct, that the decedent still would have been killed. So part of the problem with the government's theory in the case here has lots of problems. Part of the problem is that there's no evidence that Blaine fired his gun, and that that's what instigated Carter first to respond and that's the that's the hypothetical or the you know the example given in Fleming right where somebody else who might be on your side of the v in the urban gun battle fires their gun first but it's not you and if it's not you you cannot under Fleming be found to be the actual but cause because why does it matter who fires first well Fleming says it does why because if you subtract out the second shooter who joins in and the shooting was already happening and the counter shooting by the shooting by the opponent was already happening it's not the well, conduct if the shooter of, joins in as if the first shooter causes the second shooter to join in then i, I take your point but i don't know that that's the situation we have here let me ask you another question, if I may. The government's answer to some of these arguments, or one answer the government gives to some of these arguments, is that um, it really doesn't matter because uh, Mr. Blaine was a but-for cause because he joined with Mr. Burke in setting up the ambush. And it's the act of setting up the ambush uh, from which everything flows and um, makes Blaine a but-for cause. How do you respond to that? That well, you mean that Mr. Blaine and Mr. Burke were working together here? The the theory of aiding and abetting. I think that's part of the theory. Yeah, okay. they set up an ambush. They did. They, I, I don't remember the facts well enough to tell you how they set it up exactly. They they got together and they said, "Let's do an ambush." And you go there, and I'll go here. And, we'll, and Mr. Carter comes. We'll we'll ambush him, and they do it. Now, if Blaine is a participant in that, the government or something like that, Mr. Coleman will correct me if I've got the facts wrong. Um, you know, uh, but the government's argument is by setting up that ambush, Mr. Blaine was the but-for cause of what happened in the ambush. First, Your Honor. The, the, the death of Mr., the death of the victim. Yeah, first, Your Honor, again, I think it's precluded by Fleming. Absolutely precluded. It's the same factual pattern in terms of who shoots and who starts it. And Fleming on those facts said, in light of Barrage, a Supreme Court case, we hold that the instructions given in Roy in this case do not adequately convey, possibly barring No, there was an error here. Well, I, I understand there was an error here. That, that, that I, we all agree. The, the instructions did not require the jury to find but for causation. But the government says there is but for there is in fact but for causation. And if the jury had been instructed, the jury undoubtedly would have found it because they would have found that at a minimum, Blaine set up or helped set up the ambush. Your Honor, that's what I'm asking your response to. I understand that. And part of my response to that is, is not to say, I, I know that Fleming is there and we all know in, we, that's established. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that Fleming on these facts says that a defendant cannot be held to have personally caused a death unless an action by the defendant is a but-for cause. And, and on similar facts in Fleming, they say no. They say there's no room here for accomplice liability. And in fact, the government in that case concedes there's no room, but there's more here. And I have more of a response to your question. There was no theory ever presented to this jury of what you just said. There was no theory of aiding and abetting. In fact, pre-trial, the government gets an instruction from the trial court that no one should be talking about Burke's culpability. So this idea that somehow they're acting in tandem and that this is the theory that's presented to the jury isn't only not true on this record, where the government repeatedly argues that it's, it's Blaine's actions in, at his own hands that are the reason why he should be found guilty. They never say, there's no argument, no theory that it's some, some in tandem action. Instead- Ms. Soltis, I'm sorry, if I may interrupt. Yes, Your Honor. I understand that there's, we don't know who fired first, who fired second, but we 
there is evidence that Mr. Carter was shot at by two people before he shot back. Is that correct? Yes, eyewitness testimony supports that. That two people. And the jury could, on this evidence, do you think, uh, find beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Blaine was one of those people? Based on the eyewitness testimony, yes. the jury could okay. find that. Okay, how much do we know about what happened? Well, one, how it came about that Mr. Carter shot at um, Mr. Adenikinju. Um, was that, I mean, it wasn't just a wild stray bullet or, a, or a, a bullet ricocheting around, right? He shot at him? That's the evidence, Your Honor, yes. That he shot directly at, at him, right? That is the evidence. Okay. Was there shooting after that? Did the shooting continue after that? Yes. An eyewitness says that, Mr. Ramsher says that there was still shooting happening. And I believe Ms. Romaine also, also may say that there that the shooting was still happening. No, I think that's just Mr. Ramsher says that. What I'm trying to get at is that, I, and I understand because believe me, I have been focused on that hypothetical that, that you, it's not a hypothetical and the, the, and the court is very clear that in saying that the jury could not on those conclusions where somebody else fires first and then Mr. Fleming and, and all the rest find beyond a reasonable doubt that he was the, but the, uh, the actual cause. I mean, you're correct on that. Um, but there is something kind of artificial about subtracting um, Mr. Blaine's participation from what is, you know, a all of this shooting going on. And, you know, that is the actual situation of what happened. And what I'm wondering is, would, if the question is, would Mr. Carter have fired the fatal shot, but for um, Mr. Blaine's participation, right? That's the way you want us to look at this. What I'm wondering is whether Mr. Carter's action in shooting at this third person may not have been triggered by the fact that he felt that he was being shot at by two people, right? And that therefore there may be more people involved like this third person who all of a sudden he sees coming out of the car, right? As opposed to, he might not have done that if he only thought he was being shot at by one person. I mean, I don't know. It's, it, just, it just seems to me that there's a whole, you know, it was a complex situation. And what Mr. Carter does seems to have been, since he's not really shooting back at the people shooting back at him, he turns around and shoots at somebody else, right? That's closer to him. So he obviously feels that there's more than one person involved, that there's maybe more, more people. Now, it's possible that he could have thought that even if only one person, will say Burke, was shooting at him. But I would think that the likelihood that he would think that he might fear that he was being attacked by more people coming at him from different sides would be heightened if he knew that there were two people shooting at him. Is that something we take into account? Your Honor, no, because it's a it, it, it's not um, accurately portrayed on this record. What 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 is depicted on the record is the idea that the government conceded that additional shooters showed up after Mr. Blaine left. That that was an actual possibility. So I understand Your Honor's question, um, and I you know it, it it is a complex factual scene. But the complexity doesn't weigh in favor of Mr. No, I understand Blaine. that the gov what you're saying, I mean, look, that Roy instruction was given, the government thought they were entitled to the, gov to the Roy instruction, and they leaned heavily on the substantial factor. I mean, this was a whole lot. It doesn't, we don't have to prove any of these things. You know, the guy just had to have been there and shooting. That's absolutely right. That's the big concern, right? Is that what the jury in fact did is that was that the basis for their finding of guilt 
But now we are on appeal, right? It's conceded that the instruction was incorrect, impliedly conceded that the government's argument also was uh, erroneous, not in accordance with what the law is now, but was not then. Um, and our question going back to the discussion you've been having before is, okay, what if the jury had received the correct instruction, whatever that might be, <laughs> right? Um, would they? Would they have had to have a reasonable doubt, right? Is that the question we ask? Is there a reasonable probability that the jury would have come to a different a would have outcome? Um, yeah, would have acquitted. Had they, had so, they been instructed on but for questions. The reasonable possibility, probably, that they would have had a reasonable doubt as to whether he was a but for cause, right? Yeah. On these facts. That's why I'm looking at the facts as opposed to. Um, what was argued to them and the rodents instruction that was given to them. And it's hard to kind of get one's head around that because yeah. we really don't even know how they would have gone about thinking about it. But well, we do know what the facts were. And that's why I wanted to look at the actual facts and that it was such a you know, complicated situation. I, I, Your Honor, I think it is the indeterminacy of the facts that is the is the is the clearest response to to your line of questioning. No, Ms. Saltis, what we'd like to hear you argue is there's a reasonable probability that the jury would have had a reasonable doubt about X and therefore for the following reasons and therefore would have acquitted given a reason given a given a um, what for causation instruction. So start your sentence by saying there's a reasonable probability that the jury would have had, had a reasonable doubt about, and now you fill in the blanks. Okay. There's a reasonable probability that the jury would have had a reasonable doubt about Mr. Blaine being the actual but for cause of the fatal shot here. The reasons for that reasonable doubt would have stemmed from one, that there is no evidence whatsoever that if Mr. Blaine hadn't fired his gun, that Mr. Adekinju would be alive today. And that's because number one, the government conceded that there's a re an entirely additional alternative theory here that is corroborated by their own evidence that Mr. Blaine did whatever he did and then he left. And that additional shooter showed up and Mr. Carter fired the fatal shot at that point. Number one, that's number one. You can't get past that. That dooms actual cause. Is there, but is it factually established? You, you started to say before you responded to Judge Glickman's question that there was some murkiness in the fact. Is it factually clear from this record that Mr. Uh, Carter fired the fatal shot after these additional shooters came on the scene? Or is that what Mr. Blaine tried to argue to the jury? Miss, Mr. Blaine didn't argue that to the jury, Your Honor, because again, this was all under the Roy instruction. There was, there was, there was no talk about actual cause. Is, is that sequence of facts that you just described in response to Judge Glickman's question, one that's clear on the record that, that the, the fatal shot fired by Carter, killing the um, decedent, was not fired until after Mr. Blaine left? Or is there some ambiguity as to when, when the fatal shot was fired in the midst of this gun battle and, and when other shooters um, may have shown up on the scene? And if, if there is this murkiness, is there a, a, a remand that's necessary? Or are, are you arguing that this should be a straight acquittal? based on, uh, 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 not acquittal, uh, reverse of the conviction. Uh, okay, Your Honor, starting with your first question, the theory that I just explained comes not from Mr. Blaine, it comes from the government, because the government in its closing argument, starting on page 607 of the transcript from September 23rd, says that Mr. Blaine, in this like, purported confession to Miss 
Romaine said that he said that me and Wub, Wub is Mr. Burke's nickname, were out there shooting and then we left and other people start shooting. And then Mo thought Larry was with us and Mo turns around and shoots Larry. Ms. Solkis, <laughs> yeah. to cut to the chase on this, suppose, I'll just put it as me, okay? Suppose I were to, I were to conclude that there's no reasonable probability that the jury would have reconstructed events and thought, well, we think it's possible that Blaine left and other people came in and started shooting. Suppose there's no reasonable possible probability in our view that, that, that the jury would have entertained that as a real possibility, regardless of what the government may have said was possible in this argument. Where does that leave you if, that's, if, if that was our thinking? If we, if we reject, in other words, that re reconstructed theory as a basis for finding a reasonable probability that the outcome would have been different. Mm -hmm. Well, then you look at the, the fact that the evidence itself was far too indeterminate. On In what respect? Basis. In what particular respect do you consider it materially indeterminate? Number one, that- Leave me aside that theory that I just said. Yeah. This completely disregard that. All right, well, even if you leave that theory aside, it, there, there's no question that the government's forensic uh, firearm expert said that there was an indeterminate number of shooters of at least three. So we've got indeterminate number of shooters. Secondly, we've got an indeterminate. Is it possible, I take it you're saying, what, what I hear you saying, I think, but you haven't said it yet, is that there's a reasonable probability that the jury would have acquitted had they been instructed on but for causation because they would have said to themselves, you know, we're just not persuaded beyond a reasonable doubt that Blaine was one of the people firing at Carter. Is that what you're saying? It's not, I, I'm not saying that they would have to, they would have to have a reasonable doubt as to whether or not he was firing at all. No, what I'm saying is that they would have a reasonable doubt as to whether or not his conduct actually caused the fatal well, shot. That's the conclusion. I'm trying to get at the facts that support the conclusion. Do you think the evidence, do you think the jury would have had a reasonable doubt that there's, a re <laughs> that there's a reasonable probability that the jury could have had a reasonable doubt about whether Blaine fired before Carter fired the fatal shot? I think that the eyewitness testimony is unclear as to whether or not Blaine or Burke, even if you credit the eyewitness testimony that the shots came from the playground side, Absolutely, there is there is a reasonable doubt as to whether or not any shots were fired by Blaine. And explain as to whether any shots were fired by Blaine. No, to initiate this. In other words, in order. I didn't. To I didn't use happened. the word initiate. Okay. okay. Before <laughs> before Carter fired the fatal shot. There is evidence from the eyewitnesses that they saw Blaine, Blaine fired. Yeah, like, that's what you told me at the very beginning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is there, what you have to argue, what my question was, is there any reasonable probability that the jury would have rejected that evidence and said, well, we just can't rely on that. We don't believe that there is uh, from beyond the reasonable doubt. There is, yes, Your Honor, that there's reason that the jury would have had a reasonable doubt a reasonable probability that the jury would have had a reasonable doubt about whether or not that established the actual cause. So I'm not, it's, it's that there's no evidence here involving Blaine himself that is sufficient to find beyond a reasonable doubt that he's the actual well, cause. Let me put it this way. If I'm on a jury in this case and I'm satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that Blaine and Burke both fired at Carter and then Carter fired the fatal shot. Then I don't see the, a reasonable probability that a but-for causation instruction would have led me to say, well, I have to acquit Mr. Blaine. Are you disagreeing with that? No, I actually have some, th I have some theories actually as to why I might reach the opposite conclusion, but I'm putting them aside for now. Yeah. Uh, because I'm trying yes. to get your argument. Yes, Your Honor, I disagree okay. that that would be a proper application of the instruction. Yes, the jury so, would- So your view is that if the evidence were crystal clear 
that Blaine and Burke got together, were ambushing, and, and there's no aiding and abetting instructions, just the, the gun battle, the urban gun battle instruction. And they both were shooting at Carter before Carter fired back and shot the fatal shot. You're saying that a reasonable jury, that there's a reasonable probability that a, a reason that a jury properly instructed on but for causation would have acquitted Mr. Blaine under those facts. Yes. Okay, and, and your reason for saying that is? That on those facts, a reasonable juror applying the proper standard could not find that but for, in other words, if you subtract out Mr. Blaine's conduct, the decedent still wouldn't have died. That's not, and, and that's exactly the scenario that Fleming proposes. And, and, and is that true regard, in your view, I understand what you're saying. You're saying basically subtract out Blaine, the same thing could have happened because, the, because Carter was responding to Burke. Okay, yes. that's, and, and I understand you, I understand that. Now is, does that, does your answer depend on who fired the first, the first shot? Yes. Why? Because the, as the example in Fleming illustrates that if Blaine cannot be shown beyond a reasonable doubt to have started this himself by firing the first shot, then a jury cannot find that Carter wouldn't have fired back but for Blaine's conduct. If Blaine and Burke are in a race as to who fires the first shot. What difference does it make which one fires it? Your Honor, it's it's the court's instruction in Fleming that says it, it does matter. And the instruction says nothing about first shots. Not that I recall. Anyway. No, it, it, the, their example makes clear that first shot matters. That's their exact example. But I'm asking why it matters. Because one could say, look, the second shooter was going to fire anyway. So if the first shooter didn't fire, subtract out the first shooter, the, the um, second shooter still would have fired. And you have exactly the same situation that you say uh, uh, would uh, provide but for causation. Because we don't convict based on speculation. We convict based on actual cause. And the idea that perhaps somebody else may shoot and maybe an actual cause of something we know he did different shoot. than I saw, actually no, no, no. The hypothetical is Blaine does shoot. I, but, but what you're saying is that Blaine doesn't shoot first. Blaine doesn't start it in your hypothetical from understanding. Now there is something in Ms. Soltis in the, in the course um, when they set up that example and say that it would not be sufficient for a jury. To, it, it, you're right that they refer to who shot first. In that example, they say, well, what if Fleming shot after the first shot? But they say also that he shot once, that he shot his gun once. Is that significant? Because it does say that. And I don't remember now whether that's because that was the evidence in Fleming, that Fleming had only shot once, but there isn't the evidence here. Tell me what, I may be wrong about this, correct me, um, is that Mr. Blaine's shooting was more than once, right? This was more of a, what, what kind of a, he had, he had a semi-automatic, is he that had, correct? That's what the evidence is, right? Yeah. Yes. So in that sense, this situation is a bit different from what's set up. Now, does the court make much of the fact that it was, that it said once? Um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't seem to dwell on that, but, it, but that is one of the, the facts that is set out there. Your Honor, Your Honor, yes, Your Honor, it, it does say that. Um, the, 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 the paradigm of who starts it and who fires the fatal shot is identical to the government's theory here. And the, the fact of whether or not Blaine fired, the evidence would establish that Blaine fired once or five times isn't the point. The point is that if you subtract out whatever Blaine is alleged to have done here, or you know, it's, it, the evidence shows that he did, that the decedent still would have ended up dead. And I think the argument here, while not exact of the you know hypothetical 
the example given in Fleming is actually stronger when you add back in the additional facts here. So no, two cases are never identical. But when you add in the alternative theory of additional shooters being involved here and Blaine being gone from the scene, I mean, that, that, that steps him so far back from any actual cause because when he leaves, Mr. Adekendra is still alive according to this other alternative theory. And we don't have those facts in Fleming. And the court still says, you know, even on these tighter facts where we have uh, Fleming firing from a balcony and his associate uh, firing from people's firing, you know, both at Hamlin, they still say this has to go back. That's right. um, so it's defied. Yeah, can I ask you, I know we've been talking about actual cause and this notion of subtracting the person from the from the action, from what happened, their conduct. Is there a is there a problem with proximate causation in this case? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think there that it, it, it there is, in addition, um, because of the alternative theory. And while Fleming doesn't change the law on proximate cause, and I, you know, it, it talks about it, but it doesn't, you know, take up the amici on their arguments to address it. Um, I think that you know the other theory here would be that these alternative shooters could have been a break in proximate cause. I was talking more about thinking more. I mean, that I, I get that point, but again, this note. I mean. Is it foreseeable that someone that you shoot, it's foreseeable that someone that you're shooting at is gonna shoot back, that there may be a stray bullet, but is it foreseeable that the person that you're shooting at is going to turn around and shoot directly, purposely as someone who's not involved with you at all? No, I, I don't, I, I think there's an argument that it, that it is not, of course, that it is not foreseeable. Um, and I think that when you look at the, the, the circumstances that appear to have at least under one theory, led to that direct deliberate shot by Mr. Carter, that it, that it even is a stronger argument of a break in the proximate cause chain. Because, you know, the idea that it, it, it would be foreseeable that additional shooters would show up and prompt Carter to turn around and shoot Mr. Adekinju only further attenuates the proximate causation. All right, Ms. Soltis, um, I know you reserved some time for a rebuttal. We're well over your 30 uh, minutes. Um, so let's hear from the, the, the government and then we'll allow you some time for a rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Your Honors. Uh, Nick Coleman for the United States. Uh, may it please the court. Uh, I'd like to begin, first of all, uh, uh, by just want to clarify what the standard of review is, here is for this instructional error. Obviously, the government has argued that appellant waived this argument by not raising it uh, either in his first appeal or in his opening brief. Um, we continue to believe that this court should not entertain uh, this late raised claim. Even if this court does, however, as appellant uh, conceded uh, from the very beginning when he raised this claim, the plain error standard applies. So we're not, uh, this is not a case like Fleming where there was an objection, a timely objection at the trial court to the instruction. And thus the only thing that we're asking here is whether uh, there is a reasonable probability of a different ver verdict if the proper instruction had been given. Uh, appellant has to do, has to show more than that. Uh, he's got to show not only that uh, for purposes of showing that he was substantially prejudiced, but also uh, that he can meet the fourth prong of the Alano test, namely that there uh, essentially has been a miscarriage of justice. That we don't think uh, has been shown here uh, today. Um, uh, proceeding first of all to uh, the idea, um, it, it's, it seems to me that the appellant is raising uh, two sort of different arguments here about the facts. Mr. Bowman, before you yes, get sir. to that, and I apologize for interrupting you, but I want you, you started out by saying there's not just a plain error situation here, but a waiver situation because um, appellant did not raise, not only did not raise the instructional objection at trial, but also uh, did not raise it in uh, the opening brief on appeal. But we're still on the direct appeal in the direct appeal stage. And after Fleming, 
was decided, appellant was allowed to supplement his opening brief by raising the additional issue. So while I see that we're in plain error territory, I don't think I understand why you argue that we're not only in plain error territory, but we're beyond that, we're, we're an absolute waiver. Right. Well, I, I think for the same reason, I mean, that this court can exercise its discretion not to entertain uh, arguments that are raised for the first time in a reply brief. Uh, it can also exercise its discretion not to raise claims that were not raised even in an earlier direct appeal, which was the case here. But, too. but given that when the direct appeal was taken, Roy was the law, um, and given that Fleming, Fleming himself was allowed to raise this issue for the first time in a uh, petition for rehearing on Bonk, um, and nobody, nobody uh, gave him too hard a time about waiver or even plain error for that matter. Um, I don't know that. Uh, is, I don't know why we would exercise our discretion to prevent him from saying, okay, look, while this case was, while my appeal was pending, you've decided Fleming on Bonk, so I want to supplement my arguments. I don't know why we would exercise so, that to say there's a waiver. I, I, I would point out that Fleming actually did challenge the instruction, not only at trial, but also on his uh, initial direct well, appeal before the his, panel. Yes, his, not the his same argument. However, were, by no means the same argument. Well, Ed, right, no. and uh, I, obviously um, the government uh, 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 complained about that uh, at Fleming, but but uh, those complaints were not heard. So uh, I don't want to re-argue uh, the procedural posture of Fleming, obviously, but uh, I do think um, what Fleming did show was that a claimant can challenge an instruction, even if this court has previously approved it. That challenge was certainly available uh, to Mr. Blaine uh, throughout this, and I would point well, out. Well, we're I mean, in plain case, There's yes. no question about that. But uh, I just want uh, to take you off on this question of waiver, which would put a different cast on this whole issue. Right, and you know, and, and the only thing I, I would just hasten to add here: this this case, uh, you know, a, a appellant filed his opening brief back in 2016. Uh, it's been another five years. Uh, if if this case had to be retried, we're talking about a crime that was committed in 2007. Uh, and, and, you know, it, the more time goes by, the more difficult it becomes to uh, retry cases to make sure that they're properly uh, adjudicated. And when appellants don't bring their claims in a timely fashion, uh, it can result in delays, and, and, and we're seeing those delays now. But to proceed to to uh, can I can I interrupt, yes, uh, Mr. Coleman, to, to just to focus you on the plain error analysis? Yes, sir. You said you thought that under the final prong of Alano, uh, that there would not be any miscarriage of justice if even if the but for. Um, analysis and instruction were applied here. But um, I mean, the but for standard is a, a higher standard and tougher standard for the government to meet than the instruction that was given in Roy on substantial likelihood of participation. Um, and I, I guess I'd ask of you the same thing that we asked of um, Ms. Soltis, why would the government be able to satisfy that higher threshold? There's a murkiness um, of some of the facts as we've been discussing, which are, are important to how we apply this but for causation test. Um, you've also alluded to the fact of the age of the case. Um, you know, if we find that but for causation was appropriate and um, the instruction was an error, what's the remedy that the government would be a proponent for? But first, can you show us how you would have satisfied the higher threshold of the but for uh, causation analysis here? Yes, Your Honor. And so I, I would focus, uh, first of all, on two facts that were not, uh, that, that I think either one fact that was not in dispute and a second fact that was clearly found by the jury that had to have been unaffected by the instructional error. The first fact that was not in dispute at trial was that Mr. Carter fired the killing shot because he was ambushed. Uh, there was never any argument, and the defense did not, uh, co did, did not contest that. In fact, the defense acknowledged that Carter is the man seen sauntering across the parking lot uh, just before the shooting starts. It's clearly not in distress or expecting anything. And it's at that point that uh, the, a gunman who is lying, basically hiding and wait and has been watching for him, 
suddenly darts out into the parking lot and fires at it. The defense didn't contest uh, that sequence, uh, sequence of events and didn't contest what the government said all along and expressly argued, which was that Carter, you know, the, the victim would not have been shot by Carter if he had not been ambushed, if he had not been attacked. The contested issue uh, at trial was, was Mr. Blaine one of the gunmen who ambushed Mr. Carter? The jury clearly found that he was. Why did they do that? Because uh, uh, two, uh, there were two eyewitnesses who identified him as one of the gunmen. Uh, that was Ms. Hinson and uh, Mr. Ramsewer. Uh, then of course, there was also the motive evidence that was provided by Ms. Crockett about the confrontation between Mr. Carter and Appellant and Burke earlier in the day. But the most important fact that the jury must have found uh, was that Blaine was in fact one of the men shooting at Carter in the parking lot uh, as the victim died. Uh, so those two facts are independent and unaffected by any instructional error uh, from the Roy instruction. So what does that leave us here? Mr. Uh, before and, before yeah. you say what does that leave us, Mr. Palmer, let me ask you a couple of questions about that. When you say that the jury must have found that Blaine was in fact one of the gunmen who ambushed Carter, shooting at him as the victim died. Um, is it correct that the jury must have found that Blaine actually fired before Carter, before the victim was shot? So that I'm not, again, I'm not saying that, that might be a slightly, but I, I'd like to know what we think okay. the jury must and must and, or must not have necessarily so, uh, found. I would go back to, in terms of the timing of Mr. Adenikinju's death, uh, that is provided for us uh, by, by Ms. Romaine's testimony. She testifies that there's a series of shots uh, that come from the playground side first. That's the first set of shots she hears. Then she does see Mr. Carter shooting, okay, and here is his shots. There are shots continuing uh, from the two, and it's at that point, and she says that, you know, Mr. Adenikinju, I believe, uh, it, 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 as I recall, she says Mr. Adenikinju pushes her and her daughter out. He tries to get out, and it's at that point that he's shot. Um, it is, uh, you know, certainly based on, he, he clearly is shot based on the ballistics evidence brought by Mr. Carter. Uh, but again, this is after the melee has been well underway. Uh, so I think that, you know, it, again, is it possible to tell on the basis of sort of hard video evidence that we know for sure that both of the gunmen uh, firing at Mr. Carter necessarily did so before Carter fired the killing shot. That's a slightly harder question to answer than the question of whether Mr. Carter uh, was firing at all because he was ambushed. That is absolutely clear. Uh, but, but by really ambush, not... you, but what if, 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 if you don't know if if it's not clear whether the both of them shot at Mr. Carter before Mr. Carter shot Mr. Adenikinju, what does ambush mean? So I think ambush here, first of all, one person can ambush another uh, by himself. Uh, I think here, the, you know, certainly the timing based on how the uh, witnesses describe the shooting as the gunshots start on the playground side. If you look at the ballistics evidence, uh, there is a, you basically have a very large number, about 24 shell casings from two nine millimeter semi-automatic weapons that are all found uh, on the playground side, essentially in front of uh, 250, I believe it's 2506 and 2508 uh, in the, the buildings there in the, in the parking lot. Uh, so, and that corresponds at least to one, you know, at, at some of those shell casings are correspond to where you see the gunman dart out into the parking lot and fire. Uh, the, it, it's hard to see how the jury could not have concluded that this was a coordinated ambush by uh, two gunmen, certainly two, the two gunmen carrying the two guns that fired or, or expelled the cartridge casings found uh, in that area. The, you can see 
uh, a second person sort of hiding behind the cars just at the edge of the video, I would point out there are a number of the shell casings are found just behind that person. Uh, so that's where the second gunman was actually shooting from. Whereas the first gunman is the one that I, I say first, uh, not necessarily in terms of sequence, but that's where uh, the gunman we can see in the video is shooting from. There was really no contest here at trial, however, that there were two gunmen, at least, uh, but certainly two gunmen. They are identified by Mr. Ramsour, both of them as Blaine and Burke, by Ms. Hinton, at least one of them being Blaine, shooting at Carter. And Carter's shooting back in response. He shoots the victim because he's being ambushed. The government expressly argued that. Uh, the government argued in closing, if they hadn't shot at Carter, the victim would be alive today. Carter would, you know, he would have gotten in his car, he would have driven off. So, so assume, that, that causation is not an issue. Okay, so let's assume that even if the jury had been given the but-for causation instruction, there's no reasonable likelihood that it would have failed to find that both Blaine and Burke were firing at Carter before Carter fired the fatal shot. Now, before I ask you my question about that, let me just ask one further factual question. I take it that the evidence does not establish who fired the first shot, Blaine or Burke. Is that correct? That's correct, because we don't know, uh, you know, even if we knew for sure that the man who darted out behind, we, we don't know if they fired at exactly the same time. Uh, and we don't know, assuming one of them fired first, which one fired uh, exactly the very first shot at Mr. Carter. That is true. Okay. So now the Saltis's argument is that even if Blaine and Burke were both firing uh, at Carter, Berg, Bl uh, Blaine, uh, the jury could have had a reasonable doubt as to whether Blaine was the but-for cause of that shooting. Because if you subtract Blaine's conduct out of this scenario, you're left with Burke shooting at Carter and the same result could have occurred. The ambush would have occurred the same, this Carter would have killed the victim. How do you respond to that? And that, so, that takes off, as I'm sure you know, on a hypothetical given uh, in um, the Fleming on Bach opinion. Yes, right. So I, I think uh, the answer there is provided uh, by cases uh, like Green and Hazel, uh, and then also by a later case before this court that relied on them, Owens, uh, in 2009 that talked about uh, essentially what happens when you've got basically two, two co-principles essentially attacking or carrying out the same crime. Uh, and, even in, and what the court said was even in the absence of an aiding and abetting instruction, uh, which in those cases it was not given, uh, the jury, uh, the, the, jury they, the, the verdict was nonetheless affirmed on the idea that the actions of the one co-principal can be attributed to the other. This, I think, um, in, in the case in Burridge, uh, the Supreme Court mentioned uh, this concept of sort of the independent, uh, you know, e even assuming that they are independent tortfeasors, right, where you've got, you know, two supposedly independent causes of the same problem. Uh, and, you know, where, you know, each one would have been sufficient to cause this. And in other words, both Blaine or Burke firing independently would have been sufficient uh, to cause Carter to fire back and eventually kill the victim. But you could somehow say, well, they weren't necessary because one of the other ones was there. Uh, tort law still allows uh, recovery against both of those tort feasors. And I think uh, what Green is expressing is a similar concept in the criminal law, which is was that the, both of them- the Which Green case are you referring to? I'm, is this the one in your brief? Yes, that's the one in our brief. It relies on a case called Hazel. There's also a case called but Owens. Is a, wait, the Green Sorry. case is a, is a drug distribution case? That's right. Um, and in that is, case, there was no aiding and abetting instruction given, as you say, and there correct. wasn't one here. But in that case, I thought the court kind of fell back on the definition of distribution that was 
given in an instruction to the jury and said that because of that, the jury could have found that uh, Mr. Green, I guess, uh, was distributing because I take it he's the one who went and found uh, the buyers, the clients. But we That's can't, correct, the, but... the problem here is that we can't fall back on the instruction that was given because it was a defective instruction, right? So I don't think so. I, I, again, I think that that comparison is a bit apples and oranges. Uh, what we're asking here, because we're asking us uh, an additional question that wasn't presented uh, in green. We cited green, and I, I would also direct this court uh, to Owens for the United States, and that's 982 A. Second 310 that applied the same principle to uh, a murder and aggravated assault case. Uh, it talked about where people were you know, basically eight, two defendants are attacking the same victim. Uh, but the, the principle that, that Green was citing was the idea is that as long as uh, the defendant you're asking about is a co-principal as to at least one element of the offense, uh, in other words, this isn't somebody who's sort of, you know, it, this isn't a case uh, in our case, just, just apply it to the facts here. This is not a case where the government's theory was that Blaine provided the gun to Burke uh, or something. In other words, where he's, he's not actually a direct co-principal in any specific element, but he's assisting the principal. Uh, he's, he's only assisting the principal, but he's actually attacking with a gun at the same time, essentially, as uh, Mr. Carter. It's just that we can't tell in, in this case, because it is true, I suppose, that if you subtracted one, uh, you couldn't be sure, uh, in, in fact, probably couldn't be sure that Carter wouldn't have been forced to fire back if only one of them had attacked as opposed to two. The point of, of Green and the reason why we cite it is because it does deal with this problem of the fact that for whatever reason, the trial court here apparently erroneously left out the aiding and abetting instruction. Uh, the government argued that Burke and Appellant were acting together and that was certainly the absolute, that was exactly what the evidence would have showed. They had the same motive uh, and they were both shooting at the same time. So it's hard to see why the jury would have thought that they were, you know, that, that they had no idea that the other one was shooting. Uh, but now we're asking the question though of uh, that the separate in the question which is presented here today, did the lack of the but for language that this court has insisted on post Fleming, uh, did that, influence the verdict here? In other words, did it allow the jury uh, to convict when it might not have? And I think the answer again is no. I do wanna to respond to one of the arguments that it, it seems that the appellant is sort of arguing two things here. One is this aiding and abetting problem. In other words, where, uh, what if, what if uh, Burke alone or just Burke by himself caused this? And I think that is answered by, uh, you know, what this court has said in Green and Hazel and Owens uh, which and just the concept where if you have two independent uh, and sufficient causes. Uh, well, I would have thought so perhaps, but I am wondering about how that squares with the hypothetical given in Fleming, uh, in which, um, and I'll paraphrase because it's a rather lengthy hypothetical. Um, the question is raised, um, what happens if somebody um, if the shooting gets started and um, then somebody joins in and fires at, uh, joins in the shooting uh, uh, and fires um, before the victim is killed. The hypothetical posits that that, uh, that a jury could not um, find that person to have been a but for a cause. And Ms. Saltus picks up on that and argues that um, you have to distinguish between Burke and Blaine in this case, because Burke could have been the first shooter and Blaine could have been simply the second shooter. How do you, and, and her argument is only the first shooter is the, you know, which really seems to me to rest on that hypothetical. And I uh, think the answer, right. Go ahead. I, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, no, go ahead. Uh, you know what I was going to say, and probably everybody else does too. So go ahead. No, no. I, I, uh, so at the, as I understand it, so so the, the problem that was posited there in Fleming was the problem where uh, 
where you're not sure there, uh, the problem of course, was that you had Hamlin who was clearly not aiding and abetting Fleming. He is one of the targets. He's with the group that's being targeted uh, by Fleming. Uh, Hamlin so the, there was no, the, I'm sorry, go ahead. Hamlin's I'm in sorry. the position that, Hamlin there was in the position that Carter was in here. Exactly, so. yes, exactly. Hamlin is like Carter. Uh, the person who was sort of like Burke uh, to, you know, uh, who, who was essentially Burke to Fleming's uh, Blaine was Peoples, okay? And P Peoples is the one who's across the street. Uh, there, so again, as, as I understood the court's hypothetical, it was really uh, aimed at the problem of Hamlin because what if Hamlin had fired the killing bullet and what if he had done so uh, essentially not in reaction to anything that uh, Fleming did. Uh, what if he had done it? And, and, and there, I think part of the problem was that in Fleming, although there was, I, there was an eyewitness who said that, that Peoples fired a shot, uh, the ballistics evidence showed that he hadn't. Um, he had a, it was, there was pretty good evidence that he had a gun based on his actions later but not that he actually fired anything. So the problem was it was not something where the government could argue um, quite as forcefully that we knew for sure Hamlin was, was firing in re response to something Peoples did, even if Fleming was not the first shooter. Okay, so in other words, there's this possibility that Hamlin independently on his own decided to fire not because he was provoked, uh, not in self-defense or because he was caused to do so by peoples. Uh, and of course, he's not even aware that Fleming's there because Fleming is firing from up above. Uh, but that's why we don't have the situation here. Well, here, no, we well, I don't, think I, I don't think I agree with you. There were different, it is true that the court in Fleming and the trial court in Fleming for that matter had to deal with different alternative um, theories of liability. Whereas here we only deal with one. But I think that on appeal in the on Bach opinion, that discussion really was relating to, maybe not identical, but a very similar situation. It was positing that, and it was positive throughout the appeal really, that what we're dealing with is a situation in which Hamlin was returning fire because he was under attack. And, and, and the only distinction really is that in there were other possibilities in, in Fleming for what happened, whereas in this case, it's pretty clear Carter was returning fire. And, right. so, so I don't think that's a ground for distinction. I mean, Miss, Miss, Miss um, uh, uh, Saltis is basically arguing that um, uh, Blaine here is in the position that Fleming was in there. He joined in, perhaps, but he wasn't the first shooter, or at least the jury didn't have evidence that he was the first shooter, and therefore couldn't, you know, would have to, in effect, consider him as someone who was like Fleming. Fleming gets a new trial. Is <laughs> her, her argument? So, um, I, go ahead, John. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I mean, I, I don't know that I can state it better than I've said it. I think you so understand. I, 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 in, 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 in contrast to Ms. Soltis, I do not, and, and I believe there's language in there that, that says, Ed Fleming does not rule out the concept of liability under the urban gun battle theory that, that Fleming left, left there under a aiding and abetting. In other words, that uh, it's not necessarily the case that the specific, def that the only co-defendant who can be held liable under uh, the urban gun battle theory is solely the person that the government can prove was the first shooter. If oh, one let me can show that one of I'm tough. sorry, go ahead. No, no one disagrees with that. The, yeah. But that's an alternative theory of criminal liability that was not argued in this case. That was not, on well, which the jury was not instructed. I thought that you were bringing up the aiding and abetting under the fourth prong of plain error review. Which not we are. Not manifest injustice. Okay, but it's not. Well. This is not a, a, a third prong issue, is it? Well, it's, it's, a, it's both, I suppose, in this sense, uh, which is that the, uh, although what I think Green and Owens show is that even when the jury is not 
is not instructed uh, on aiding and abetting liability. If the evidence is there to support it, and here the government did argue, although it didn't use the word aiding and abetting, but it argued that, um, in fact, from the very opening statement, the government said Burke and Blaine pounced on Carter. And I don't think anybody at this trial uh, had any misimpression as to what the government's theory was, uh, namely that Blaine and Burke were working together to try to kill Carter and that it was Carter's responding to both of them. Uh, so I think the, the answer is this, that if the only uh, you know, problem here that we have uh, is that the trial court failed to give an aiding and abetting instruction, uh, then first of all, I think even Green shows that on its own, that's not a reason to throw out the verdict. But I think certainly here where we're talking about a plain error claim, that is not the kind of, uh, it, it's, it's certainly not a miscarriage of justice uh, to say uh, where we can be pretty sure that a properly instructed jury uh, would have, you know, not just pretty sure, but we can be very confident uh, that a properly instructed jury would have found uh, that one of these two gunmen working together, appellant or his accomplice, uh, Burke, by firing first, started the melee, continued it, it was a joint venture, they're both shooting at Carter, and Carter kills the victim in response to them. And again, just to go back to the beginning of my argument, that basic fact, uh, which is that Carter killed the victim because he's being shot at, was can not I, can contested. I, uh, can I stop you at that yes, point sir. just for a moment, Mr. Coleman, because you know it strikes me, and Ms. Ms. Solti started out her argument with this uh, similar point, that Carter's been acquitted um, so has Blaine's um, uh, uh, accomplice, alleged accomplice, um, and 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 they were acquitted on the Roy instruction under a uh, lower threshold, if you will. And it seems to strike me as somewhat odd that in, under these circumstances, the government would essentially be asking us to convict. Blaine, who's sort of the lowest person on the totem pole from some perspective in terms of how you might view these facts, um, to, to reverse his, uh, I'm sorry, to uphold his conviction on a higher threshold, having um, acquitted parties that arguably might be more culpable, such as Carter, who fi fired the fatal shot that killed the um, decedent. Um, it's, it's, so it, it does seem to me that the, the, the government has a, a, a bit of an uphill hurdle here on the, um, on the under the plain error standard here. Um, could you sort of speak to that? Um, and, and when yes, we sir. don't have the clear aiding and abetting uh, instruction here, which uh, might have minimized the impact of this point that I'm making and that was made by the appellant. Right. So I, I guess I would respectfully disagree that uh, uh, Mr. Blaine here is the lowest man of the totem pole. I, I, I think actually the evidence showed he was by far the most culpable person. Now, yes, Mr. Carter fires the killing bullet, but he, after all, has a very, has a pretty powerful self-defense claim. And that's what he argued at that first trial. He was acting in self-defense. Uh, he was being attacked. Now, the, the government's theory at that first trial was that he had forfeited his right to self-defense by remaining on the scene after the initial confrontation that he was, he had armed himself. The jury didn't accept that and obviously could not find beyond a reasonable doubt that he wasn't acting in self-defense. But there was never any question, he's ambushed there. I mean, he's not trying at that moment to start some gun battle uh, with, with Blaine and Burke uh, such that you know, uh, innocent bystanders may be killed. In terms of between Mr. Blaine and Mr. Burke, the problem for with with the and, and, and I think the reason why Mr. Burke was eventually acquitted is that the evidence of identification was weaker as to him. Remember, you have two witnesses uh, who identify appellant as, Mr. Blaine as being one of the gunmen, Ms. Hinson uh, and Mr. Ramsour. Mr. Ramsour is the only one who identifies Mr. Burke specifically as one of the two gunmen. He says both of them, it's Blaine and Burke, but he's the only one who says it's Burke actually shooting there. Ramsour had credibility problems that Ms. Hinson didn't have, namely that he had a lot of prior convictions. He was uh, incarcerated at the time. 
and the defense certainly uh, attacked his credibility uh, very extensively. Ms. Hinson, uh, who was a teenage girl at the time, uh, certainly didn't have those same credibility problems. She identifies, uh, however, only Mr. Blaine as being one of the gunmen. Uh, so I th in addition, we know that you know, Blaine was the one earlier in the day based on Ms. Crockett's testimony. Blaine is the one who actually shoots at Carter's car uh, during the early comp earlier confrontation. Burke gets involved only at the tail end of that confrontation. I don't think that it can be said that Mr. Blaine was the least culpable person here. In fact, I would submit he's the most culpable person here and he's also the best identified. That is why he was convicted both at the very first trial, uh, even when the others weren't, and it's why he was convicted uh, at the retrial. And I, I would point out that uh, my understanding of the record is that that initial retrial, the one at which Burke is uh, acquitted, uh, that the jury hung 11 to one in favor of Mr. Blaine's uh, conviction. So I don't think, now again, I'd, I'd have to dig through the record to find that, but that is my understanding. Uh, I don't think here that we can say that Mr., uh, that certainly on plain error, uh, that somehow an injustice has been done. And Mr., you know, uh, Mr. Blaine was just somebody along for the ride. I, I hear you. The best making... evidence here is that he's the driving force behind this. Yeah, I hear you making two arguments, and I, I'm sort of, I'll tell you how my thinking is going. One, one argument you're making is that even though an aiding and abetting instruction was not, in fact, given to this jury, um, because we're in um, plain error territory, we can say under the fourth prong that no miscarriage of justice was uh, occurred. Um, even assuming uh, the first three prongs of plain error are met, because an aiding and abetting instruction should have been given. The government should have asked for it. It should have been given. And had it been given, this would be a no-brainer. And um, while those things may be true, I'm not sure I'm convinced that that's the proper use of the fourth prong of plain error analysis, because we look at the trial that there was rather than an imaginary trial that, you know, how it could have been done. I'm troubled by that. Um, and my general understanding has been rather to the contrary, that a conviction cannot be upheld on a theory of accomplice liability if the jury was never instructed at all on accomplice liability as a theory. Um, the, the, and if Green and Hazel and Owens are in some tension with that, it's only some tension. They're not really, they don't really, I don't think, completely really part of that. On the other hand, I'm also thinking that maybe the thing to say is something along the lines of the hypothetical in Fleming that has, I think, caused us all some concern about what it means. Um, it may be misleading. And be, be, because while it may say, yes, you can subtract out either of those two people and they're not but for causes, um, the, the, this is just an exception to the but for causation rule, an exception for two co-principles, where if either one is a sufficient by their actions, um, you're doing something that it would be sufficient by itself and uh, particularly, I suppose you could say, if they're acting together. Uh, though sometimes you have true independence. Um, the, um, the, the, uh, it, it doesn't matter that you could subtract either one out and the result would have been the same. They're still both liable because that comports with our sense of justice and so on and so forth. Do you have a reaction to that? Yes, Your Honor. I, I, I think that is... To both parts of what I gave you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and I, well, certainly to the latter part, I would say the following. I think that, as I argued earlier, I think that is kind of the message that, uh, it, that, that, that line of thinking. In other words, the idea that even if, you know, you could subtract out one of these defendants and the victim still would have been beaten up or the drug still would have been dealt, uh, that nevertheless, they're acting together at the same time. Uh, 
Uh, that's why I think Green comes to uh, the conclusion that it does. That's why Owens does. That's why Hazel comes to that conclusion. It's because, uh, you know, even if, you know, to, to simply subtract one out and say, like, that, that allows you to subtract everybody out and say, well, out of this group of three people uh, who are, you know, two or three or, or whatever number of people who killed or injured the victim, since we can't say the victim wouldn't have suffered the same injuries if we'd subtracted any of them out, uh, that's all we need to know. And now, I think that is on, why. If, sorry. The, one, the one problem that, that leaves, uh, leaves me, at least, is that we still have the problem of a um, deficient instruction at trial, the Roy instruction. And it, it sort of leaves open what the proper instruction should be in the co-principal case that we're talking about here. Right. So I, I, th I think part of the, the problem that Fleming did not uh, address, and specifically, as I recall, left open uh, exactly how its urban gun battle instruction would interact with aiding and abetting liability, uh, with accomplice liability. So it did not, and again, I think it was because of the particular facts in that case, which uh, made it much harder uh, for the government to argue uh, that even if uh, the jury had somehow wondered exactly when Fleming started shooting or whether Hamlin hit, Hamlin was the one who hit the victim, uh, that regardless, the whole thing was started by Peoples, okay? That we couldn't argue on the evidence there that, that, that we knew the jury would find that. I don't think in this case uh, that the jury would have had any doubt. Once they concluded uh, that Blaine was one of those gunmen, uh, it, it's hard for me to see how the jury would have come to any other conclusion uh, than that his actions caused, uh, together with whoever was helping him, uh, likely Burke, caused uh, Carter to shoot back. Um, and, and I think in, because uh, we can be pretty, you know, we, we can not just pretty, but very confident of that, certainly on plain error review, this is not the kind of case that requires, uh, requires reversal uh, uh, under either the third or the fourth prongs of the Ilana test. I did want to briefly address something, uh, one, one of the arguments that we, I have not yet had a chance to touch on uh, is, is what seems to be the primary factual argument uh, raised by appellant here which is the idea that the government conceded that there were additional gunmen who, who joined in. I, I don't, I, I think Appellant is really trying to put an awful lot of weight on a very offhand remark made by the prosecutor in, in rebuttal. This was all started by the fact that uh, Ms. Romaine testified that Appellant came up to her after the shooting and apologized to her, admitted that he and Burke had been shooting, but then apparently in, in an effort to sort of distance himself from what ultimately happened, said, well, we left. And then he says, other people started shooting. Okay. Um, appellant vigorously uh, attacked this testimony at trial. He denied that he ever made such a statement to Ms. Romaine. Uh, in fact, his argument at trial was that she and Mr. Ramsour essentially colluded to create two independent stories of how appellant had confessed uh, to participating in the shooting later. And what the prosecutor did in response uh, on rebuttal was to sort of point out, uh, in, in an effort to rehabilitate this testimony, uh, to point out some of the points on which his statement sort of matched up to other kinds of, uh, of evidence. First and foremost, uh, that they were shooting. Uh, and she said, look, that confirms exactly what Ms. Hinson and Mr. Ramsey were told you, that he was out there shooting. Uh, that also that Carter was shooting back uh, because he was being shot at. Uh, then, uh, you know, when she made a very, the, the prosecutor made a very brief uh, remark that, uh, you know, that other people came in shooting and she said, look, you know, that the, the firearms examiner told you he couldn't rule that out. What she's referring to is there were about, I think, exactly three pieces of ballistics evidence that because they were too incomplete and damaged, could not be that the, the firearms examiner, Mr. Poole, could not trace them back to the weapons that he identified as having fired uh, the shell casings, which he said came from two guns, and a revolver, which had fired the bullet that killed Mr. Adenikinju, and then also one other bullet casing uh, he could confidently say that was found near where Mr. Carter was shooting. 
there were a couple of other bullet fragments that he said came from a revolver, probably the same caliber, but they were too damaged. So, you know, in theory, he couldn't rule out that there was another revolver. Um, but again, based on the location of those, to have argued that there was another gun in, with Mr. Carter, just no one argued that, and there certainly was no evidence uh, at all to support that. There was finally one uh, jacket of a nine millimeter bullet that was found basically in the exact area where some of the shell casings uh, were found on the playground side. And that casing couldn't, it was too damaged to be traced back, but you know, and so again, I suppose in theory, you could say that allowed the possibility of a third uh, semi-automatic gun being fired there. But again, it would have been a semi-automatic for which there was no shell casing uh, expelled. I don't think any juror would have heard that testimony or the prosecutor's argument and thought that the government was sort of endorsing an alternate theory that uh, unknown gunmen came in and sort of took over the gunfight. And it was during that time period that Carter uh, shot and killed the victim. Uh, that, that, just, that is not, I think, a fair reading of what the prosecutor was doing or how the juror, or, or how the juror would have taken this. So I think to sort of set it up as a sort of alternate theory by the government in in rebuttal, I, I, I think is stretching things a bit. Um, instead, I think, you know, again, as, as I've stated, the point of this trial was to determine whether appellant was one of the men who ambushed Carter. The jury answered that question in the affirmative. Uh, having answered that question in the affirmative, uh, it would not have failed to find, but for causation. Uh, even as this court has, has, has now defined it in Fleming, it would not have failed to find that Mr. Carter was shooting back uh, in response to the ambush that appellant directly participated in. And in light of that, uh, reversal is not uh, uh, appropriate under the plain error standard. Uh, Mr. No Coleman, yes, I'd like to ask you, you, you mentioned the, the rebuttal argument yeah. and I was just looking at it. And, and at one point, the... Um, the prosecutor says, it doesn't matter what point he was pulling his trigger, only that he was pulling his trigger going to your point. Mm -hmm. And that's why you say, I guess, that the jury found that he did, he was out there shooting, even though we don't know when exactly. And then he says, and that, and that what he was doing made it foreseeable that something like this could happen. Again, I understand that at that point, they're not having these niceties of, actual and proximate causation, but there is that foreseeability language. And I asked Ms. Soltis this, so I wanted to ask you, is there a proximate, is there an issue with proximate causation in this case, given uh, what seems to be the fact that Mr. Carter purposely um, shot um, Mr. Adenin, um, I'm sorry, I get this, but Adenin Adenin Kintu. Um, who was not, he wasn't shooting back at people who were shooting at him. He turned around and shot at somebody uh, purposely who was more in his area, as I understand it, of the parking lot. Uh, so, so my response would simply be, uh, the Roy instruction still included foreseeability. It still had proximate cause built in. So that was not the error that was identified uh, by the en banc court in Fleming. So that that argument I'm was not, no, available to a whether these. I'm asking you whether these on these facts, uh, there is sufficient evidence to to say that this was foreseeable. I, I, I absolutely think so. Uh, and, and we haven't had to brief that because it's not an argument that that appellant has raised. Uh, but the no, I know. certainly, if you shoot, if you start ambushing somebody, I think it's foreseeable that that person, particularly if they're being shot at by two people uh, at night. Uh, in a confined area. I mean, bear in mind, Mr. Carter had his back to a high retaining wall. Uh, he's surrounded by cars. It's not going to be easy for him to retreat or go anywhere. And if I think it's absolutely foreseeable that if somebody suddenly appears to your right, you've got two, at least two people shooting at you from your left, which is what uh, the ballistics and video evidence uh, would suggest as to what his position. Suddenly somebody pops up at you on your right and startles you. I think it's absolutely foreseeable that if you've ambushed somebody like that, that they may fire back at, uh, you know, not just people in the crossfire directly, uh, but at people who they think might be coming at them. Uh, so uh, 
again, it's not an issue that appellant has you know, raised or briefed here that there is something wrong with the foreseeability language uh, of Roy, and certainly this court hasn't addressed it, but I absolutely think that there was uh, a sufficient basis. It, it, you know, again, the jury was aware of the position that Mr. Adenikinji was in. So I don't, and, and I, don't, I don't think that they were um, you know, unaware of the fact that Mr. Carter had to turn to shoot Mr. Adenikinji. I mean, the, the crime scene diagrams and, and, and everything that was presented to them would have made that absolutely clear. So they were aware of this, the defense was aware of this, but nobody thought uh, it was a contestable issue that uh, Mr. Carter, if he, you know, when he fired that was because he was being ambushed. Um, and, and, and the government specifically argued, uh, you know, it, this would not have happened if- Well, that's but four. I'm, I'm talking about Carter. foreseeability. I'm talking right. about foreseeability, not-, yeah, and, not and, four. and I think it's absolutely foreseeable. Uh, and, and I don't, you know, and, and again, that was not contested by the defense at trial, uh, that it was foreseeable that once ambushed, Mr. Carter uh, might shoot back at somebody who it later turned out was not participating in the attack on him. Mm -hmm. If there are no further questions, uh, we would respectfully submit that the judgment of the Superior Court should be affirmed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Soltes, uh, uh, I think we've reserved about three minutes for your rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. First, um, the government's argument that who participates in an ambush is a basis for second degree murder is wrong, and we all know that. Fleming says participation is not enough. Second, the government concedes no hard evidence of the timing of the fatal shot, that there is an indeterminate sequence of shots and shooters, and that the evidence does not establish who fired the first shot. Third, the government's theory on aiding and abetting is a complete rewrite of this trial. At no point was it raised, at no point was it argued. When you look at the government's argument to the jury, they said things like, if Don Trace had not pulled a weapon out and began to fire down towards the end of the parking lot, they say, that made it reasonably foreseeable that death or serious bodily injury to innocent bystanders could occur as a result of Don Trace Blaine's conduct. Everything was focused on Don Trace Blaine's conduct. They can't come in now and rewrite that. And Green and Taylor don't say that they can. In fact, if you look at Green, this court found that the defendant was on notice of the aiding and abetting based on the prosecutor's opening statement, the officer's testimony, and the prosecutor's closing argument, completely unlike here. And this court has always said that jurors are presumed to follow the instructions. If you look at Jordan, that's a case right on point that says, again, we're not gonna consider that the juror made, jury may have done something that we didn't tell them to do. Finally, your honor, this is a plain air review for a, a, a clear and misleading instruction that was capitalized on repeatedly by the government. And even in Mr. Coleman's explanation of the government's embrace of this other theory, that other shooters may have been there, and that that would have been the reason why the fatal shot was fired. If we read the closing argument around that point, and it doesn't matter why, it doesn't matter what the strategy was for making that comment, it was made. And if we look at the sentence that follows, what it is is that, but you see, it doesn't matter at what point he was pulling his trigger, only that he was. So the government, again, used this alternative theory and said, it's fine if that's true. That's good. In fact, it's cooperated by the evidence. But you know what? It doesn't matter. Because why? Because of the flawed instruction that is at the root and the core of this entire trial. And that's why under plain air, we argued that it was a structural error, that this court could presume harm. That's why this court on Bonk and Fletcher, I mean, in Fleming, said that this error may defy harmless error review. Now, the government in that case didn't try to argue it. And the court said, that's good, because we're doubtful you could have made it out. Because on these kinds of facts, when you tell a jury, all you need to find is that somebody's shooting, it is so not 
remotely the equivalent, as Fleming found, of the actual but for language that is required, then it requires reversal. It requires to be complicit with due process, it requires a reversal. Because we know this jury, and all you have to hear is all the speculation that happened during this argument about how the jury may have found things. This case calls wildly for jury speculation. The government argues that there's no basis to think that if the jury found Mr. Fleming, if the jury found Mr. Blaine was actually shooting, that they must have found that he was the actual cause. No way. There was, first of all, the government told them they didn't need to specifically and repeatedly. The government told them other shooters may have showed up and that that may have led to the fatal shot. The court told them they didn't need to find it, of course, which is the instructional error. And there was no testimony or evidence that established when Mr. Blaine purportedly shot his gun in relation to the fatal shot. There's no quote, as the government says, hard evidence of when the fatal shot was fired. And the government witnesses didn't provide any evidence upon which the jury could have found beyond a reasonable doubt that if they subtracted out any shooting by Mr. Blaine, that Mr. Adekinju would not have been killed. So what did the jury find regarding the sequence of events here? We don't know. We are left to absolutely speculate any finding that Mr. Blaine was the actual cause. That speculation is what requires a reversal here. And it satisfies the prong, even if this isn't a structural error, it satisfies the prongs of Oleano for plain air review. This error was at the heart and soul of the only theory of liability presented here. Finally, on aiding and abetting, that theory should not be considered when reviewing this case under any plain error review. We look at the trial that was actually put on in front of the jury, and we look to see whether or not there is a reasonable probability that the aired instruction in the context of the actual trial, not some hypothetical one, could have made a difference. And here there's no credible response to that, given the entire record here, that it didn't. And that as a result, Mr. Blaine was convicted of second degree murder without a jury ever finding the required actual cause that the constitution mandates because of the element, it was an actual element of his crime. So, Your Honor, for those reasons, as well as the ones in the brief, we would ask that the case be that Mr. Blaine's conviction be reversed. And because there's not sufficient evidence here to support the actual cause that's required for second degree murder, that the conviction be vacated. All right, thank you. Uh, um, we thank both counsel, uh, Ms. Soltes and Mr. Coleman, for your briefs and arguments in this case. And uh, we will take the matter under advisement. This honorable court is now adjourned. All right, thank you, counsel. You're free to exit the virtual courtroom now. Thank you. Thank you.